Some technical issues. This is a re recording of the sermon entitled Why Can't I Be a Baptist, originally preached on May 7, 2023. Today we return to our series on denominationalism. Remember, this series is not intended to bash other churches, but to determine the importance of following the Bible in all that we do and not man made doctrines. In the past, we have studied about the Catholic Church the Lutheran Church, the Mennonite Church, the Anglican Church, and the Presbyterian Church. We now come to the next major denomination in our series, and that is the Baptist Church. When it comes to the history of the Baptist Church, this denomination disputes among itself as to its own origins. Some Baptists believe that their movement, movement sprang up in the 17th century, which is the 1600s, via the English separatists. This is the majority view, and John Smith in England is credited with leading the First Baptist Church along with Thomas Helvis of Amsterdam. The movement officially began in about 1609. Other Baptists believe that their movement sprang up from the Anabaptist movement that gave us the Amish and the Mennonites, and that is because there are similarities on the teachings surrounding baptism. Other Baptists assume that the Baptist faith and practice has existed since the first century. I'd like you to note that that word assume is there, and that is to distinguish from the other group that says that they know and believe that Baptist churches did actually exist from the time of Christ in an unbroken chain leading to today. In our study, we are going to be taking the majority view that John Smith established the Baptist church because in truth, we are going to find that Baptist theology didn't originate from the New Testament and Baptists really didn't come onto the scene until John Smith and Thomas Helvis. But even with that, it is not easy to pin down Baptist theology because it's so varied. The two major divisions in the Baptist church are over atonement. In other words, who did Christ die for? You have, on the one hand, general Baptists who believe that Christ died for all. That is an Arminian viewpoint on uh, atonement, not because the Arminian view, or the other view, the Calvinist view, are somehow linked to Scripture in that sense. It's just Arminius was the one who, in all intents and, for all intents and purposes, correctly interpreted the Scriptures to say that Jesus died for all. But, on the other hand, you have what are known as particular Baptists. They believe that Christ died only for the elect, and this would be the Calvinist point of view on atonement. In the United States, there are other divisions. You have the Northern Baptists and the Southern Baptists, which split around the time of the U.S. Civil War, largely over the issue of whether to appoint slave owners as missionaries. You had the South believing that that was right and good, and you had the North believing that it wasn't. Though that issue largely doesn't exist today, the division still exists in the Baptist Church from the North and the South. Then you have the split between the missionary Baptists, who were actively involved in missions around the turn of the 19th century, and primitive Baptists, who thought missionary agencies were unscriptural rivals to the local church, something like what we discussed in our sermon on authority a couple weeks ago. Then you have the split uh, between the landmark Baptists, and they believe that Jesus established the Baptist church in the first century. And then, of course, there are the Seventh-day Baptists, and they believe that churches should assemble for worship only on the Sabbath, or at least on the Sabbath uh, as being the most important day. Now, we are going to be looking at general Baptist belief, not 
don't be, get confused between general Baptists. What I'm talking about is the beliefs that most Baptists hold concerning authority, concerning salvation, and concerning worship. So, the first thing we need to look at is what do Baptists believe about authority? And in Appendix 1, which is from the gospelcoalition.org on Baptist theology, I'd like to, us to look at a couple of the points that you can find there on what Baptists believe and teach on authority. Baptists often describe the Bible as infallible, and many affirm the Bible is inerrant, meaning without error. No other writings are placed alongside the Bible with equal authority, and no single person has the right of final interpretation. Still, Baptists have traditionally adopted confessions of faith to summarize their beliefs about the Bible. A sample of Baptist confessions include the Second London Confession of 1689, the Philadelphia Confession of Faith of 1742, the New Hampshire Confession of Faith in 1833, and the Baptist Faith and Message of 1925, 1963, and 2000. They also believe that since Matthew 18, 15 to 17 presents the local church as the final court of appealing in determining its membership, Baptists do not empower any entity above the church as having authority over local church affairs. Baptists also operate under a congregational polity or governance, wherein the membership has the final word in matters governing the local church. Thus, Baptist churches select their own pastors, determine their operating budgets, and own their own church property. Although Baptist churches are autonomous, most voluntarily cooperate with one another at various levels, including local associations, state, and national conventions. So, that's a little bit about what the Baptists believe and teach on authority. So, what do we learn about that? Well, we do learn that Baptists do believe that the Bible is the Word of God, and it is where we find our authority from. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, we read, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, truly equipped for every good work. So, the Baptists do take a correct view on Scripture, is that it is inspired of God and it is our authority. It can equip us for every good work. But then you have Baptists having confessions that are made by men. And even though it is not wrong for us to list what we believe the Bible teaches, as long as it is from the Bible, the problem with these confessions of faith is that they do not agree with one another, nor do they agree with the Bible. That they don't agree with one another is a problem, for Christ didn't establish six, seven, eight, nine, ten churches. He established one church. And he didn't give three, four, five, six, seven different scriptures or revelations to mankind. He gave one. There is one faith. So that they disagree among one another, it should set off alarm bells. But more importantly, it disagrees with the Bible, uh, these confessions of faith. And so really, you have to ask yourself, does the Baptist really believe that the Bible is the final say on authority? Through these confessions, the answer to that is no. The Baptists also say they believe in local church autonomy, which is good, as we see that in scriptures, in Philippians 4, verses 15 and 16, we read, Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. For even in Thessalonica, you sent, once, uh, you sent aid once and again for my necessities. So local church autonomy, meaning that every church governs itself, there is, in essence, no denominational structure where you have one group of elders or, or one uh, group overseeing a bunch of churches, a lot like you see with the Catholic Church, with the Pope and the diocese and the archbishops and everything like that. The Baptists believe in local church autonomy, or so they say, but then they have conferences, colleges, and universities that break down local church autonomy, and that is contrary to what the scriptures say, 
as we have seen in past lessons that we have studied on authority. So, the Baptists do get some things right when it comes to what they teach on authority, but they also stray in some very major points in that their doctrines don't all agree with the Bible. And so that's a problem. So that's what the Baptists believe on authority. What did the Baptists teach on salvation? Well, for that, we have uh, Appendix 2, which is the gospelcoalition.org on Baptist theology about salvation. So let's, let's read a little bit about what they believe on salvation. So Baptists believe human beings are sinners in need of salvation, that the Father sent his Son, who is fully God and fully man, to die for sinners, and that by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, they become the children of God. Baptists reject, in, reject infant baptism on the basis of texts such as Matthew 28, verse 19, which presumes that only disciples will be baptized. In addition, baptism neither saves nor promises future salvation. Thus, they believe that baptism should follow conversion as, a, as it is an outward symbol of an inward grace, according to their interpretation of Galatians 3.27. Baptists believe the proper mode of baptism is by immersion, placing a person entirely beneath the baptismal waters. The basis for this mode is that the Greek word for baptism means to dip, immerse, or plunge. Also, since symbols are intended to communicate important truths, Immersion best symbolizes the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, following the verses in Romans 3, 6, verses 3 to 6. Some Baptists, such as Landmark Baptists, recognize only Baptist, baptisms performed in a Baptist church. A number of Baptists also practice closed communion, which permits only those who have been baptized as believers to partake in the Lord's Supper. So when it comes to what the Baptists teach about salvation, what do they get right? Well, they first get right that infant baptism is not scriptural, for children do not have sins to be remitted. In Ezekiel 18, verse 20, we read, The soul whose sin shall die. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, neither shall the father bear the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. The doctrine of original sin concerning the sin of Adam, or the guilt of the sin of Adam being passed down from Adam to all men is absolutely wrong and should be abandoned because it is not found in the scriptures and therefore should not be followed. But we also know from Mark 16 verse 16 that Jesus said, He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Can a baby believe in Jesus Christ? Well, the answer to that is absolutely not. Mark 16, 16 makes it quite clear that part of being saved is belief. It is not just being dunked in water. It is believing and is baptized. So the Baptists do get right that Infant baptism is not scriptural. They also get right that baptism is by immersion in water. That's really what the word means. Baptizo, to dip, to plunge, to immerse in water. In Acts chapter 8, verses 38 and 39, we read, So he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. Now when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away, so that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. People in the first century are often thought of as being rather unenlightened compared to us in the 21st century. But such is not really true at all. Yes, we have technology that they didn't have. We have television. We have the ability to broadcast on the internet as we are doing today. But where do we get the basis for a lot of our mathematical calculations? From people who lived before the first century. The people of that age were not the dumb people that they are portrayed in television and in books. Someone from the first century, if they were just going to pour water or sprinkle water on someone's head, would not go down 
into the water. They would scoop some water in their hand and they would pour it or sprinkle it over someone's head. Why did Philip and the eunuch go down into the water? The only logical reason is because baptism was immersion. But the word itself means immersion. So we shouldn't have to even use Acts 8, 38 and 39 to show this, even though it does provide that example. We just have to know what the actual words mean. So Baptists get right about infant baptism, and they get right that baptism is immersion in water. What do Baptists then get wrong? Well, first of all, they believe that salvation is by grace alone through faith alone. That is a Lutheran doctrine, and it's passed on to Calvinists, and really almost all denominations in the modern world believe in this doctrine of salvation by grace alone through faith alone. But the fact of the matter is, the Bible simply doesn't teach that. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, we read, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Did that verse teach that you are saved by grace alone? No, it didn't. Did it say you were saved by faith alone? No, it didn't. It said you were saved by grace through faith. You can't have something alone and another thing alone. That is just an impossibility to have two things that are alone that are somehow interconnected with each other. Grace through faith. You have to have grace and faith. So by definition, you cannot have salvation by grace alone through faith alone. But James chapter 2 verses 21 to 24 also give us this idea. In James chapter 2 and verse 21 we read, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works, and by works faith was made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled which says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see that a man you see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Luther didn't like that verse because it contradicted his teaching. He wanted to take the book of James out of the Bible. He didn't. And all the people who espouse salvation by faith alone today, try to wiggle around this verse to make it say something that it doesn't say. It says you are justified by works and not by faith only. Works doesn't mean you're earning salvation. That is not what is being said by James here. But a faith is alive only if it works. And so if you do not have any works, your faith is dead. So you cannot be saved by faith alone because faith alone is dead. It needs works in order to be alive. Works of obedience, doing what God says. It's just as simple as that. So the doctrine of salvation by grace alone through faith alone is wrong. And the Baptists are wrong for teaching it. But they also get wrong that baptism is not required for salvation. In Galatians chapter 3, verses 26 and 27, we read, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. The Baptists have flipped this verse backwards to say that as many of you as have put on Christ through faith were baptized. That's what an outward sign of an inward grace means. That you are already added to Christ through faith and through faith alone. And then you were baptized. Is that what the verse says? You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus for as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. If you have not been baptized, you are not into, if you have not been baptized into Christ, you have not put on Christ. How can you be saved without putting on Christ. The Baptist interpretation of that verse is wrong. But even leaving aside Galatians 3, 
Let's go read verse 1 Peter 3, verses 20 and 21. Who were formerly disobedient when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. There is also an antitype which now saves us, baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Did you catch that? That verse says, baptism saves. I don't know how much more clear that verse can be. No, there is not any magic in the water. It is this, But this is where God remits sins. How do we know that? Because you cannot have a good conscience towards God while having unremitted sins. Now, baptism is the antitype, the image of the shadow. What was the shadow? Well, Noah was saved through water. Was Noah saved in the water? No. He was saved in the ark. But water was the chosen means that God separated the righteous from the wicked. If you, were, uh, if you weren't in the ark, you were going to die. That's, it. That's what happened in the, in the account of Noah and the ark. But Peter here is saying Noah was saved through water because he built the ark, was in the ark, and that was the method God chose to save Noah. Well, today, God chooses the method of baptism to save man. No, again, there's no magic in the water. And really, baptism isn't a work of man at all. We go down into the water dry, dead, dead sinner. We come up out of the water a forgiven person. Why? Because God worked there. God forgave sins. And so if baptism, if Baptists get these points wrong on salvation, something that is major when it comes to the teachings of Jesus Christ, that means they're not making disciples by teaching that baptism doesn't save or baptism doesn't remit sins. And if they're not making disciples of others, they're not disciples themselves. Luke 6.46 says, But why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? If we want to be Christians, we have to do the things that the Lord says. We can't leave undone things that we just don't like or may not agree with. We have to do the things that the Lord says, and Baptists don't when it comes to to the doctrine of salvation. So that's what Baptists believe on salvation. Now coming to our last section. What do Baptists believe about worship? Well, this is uh, from Appendix 3 on Baptist Dis coming from the website baptistdistinctives.org on an article written about Baptist worship. Let's read a little bit of that about that. Baptists believe that congregational worship is an essential ingredient of church life. Hebrews 10:25. The New Testament does not provide specific instructions for corporate worship, but does contain some examples of how the first Christians worship. The Baptist denomination does not prescribe worship patterns for churches or anything else for that matter. Looking to the Bible for guidance, each congregation freely determines its own pattern. Worship by Baptist congregations differ among churches, but certain elements are almost always present. Freedom is a hallmark in each of these. The day and time for congregational worship varies among Baptists. However, most Baptists conduct worship service on Sunday, according to the examples of Acts 20, verse 7, and 1 Corinthians 16, verse 2. The number of services and the time of day from them differ among churches. The person leading in worship also may vary. In a rather typical service, the pastor presides and preaches, a song leader directs the singing, and, and designated members of the congregation and or church staff lead in public prayer, give testimonies, and take up the offering. Persons leading in worship are free to dress in whatever way a congregation feels is appropriate. Prayer is basic to all Baptist services, both private and public prayer. Mark eleven seventeen and Philippians 4, verse 6. There are no denominationally prescribed prayers. Any member of the congregation may lead in prayer. Often the pastor leads in a pastoral prayer that may be written in advance, but is usually spoken spontaneously. A sermon is a major part of Baptist worship. 
according to Acts 20, verses 7 to 9, and 2 Timothy 4, verse 2. Concerning the sermon, the preacher is free to choose a topic, theme, type, and text. The denomination dictates none of these. The style of preaches, preaching is also up to the preacher. Some read a manuscript, while most preach notes or extemporaneously. Music plays a significant role in Baptist worship services, Psalms 100, verse 2, and Ephesians 5, 19. Again, freedom is evident. Although in, practical, sorry, although in practically all churches the congregation participates in singing, the type of music that is sung varies greatly. In addition to the congregation, singing by choirs, praise, praise teams, soloists, and vocal groups can be heard in a Baptist worship. The musical instruments used in worship services also vary, including pianos and organs, as well as various other instruments. Testimonies are a common feature of Baptist worship services. The subject of the testimony depends on the person giving it and on the emphasis that the church is making at that time. An offering is usually received in the services, 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, Baptist churches are supported by tithes and gifts are freely given. Baptism and the Lord's Supper may be part of a worship service. Again, each congregation is free to choose when and how to observe these two ordinances. And a worship service can take place in almost any setting. However, weekly worship services usually take place in, the build, in a building designed especially for that purpose. So, when it comes to the worship of the church... What do Baptists get right? Well, first, the New Testament does give no set order or liturgy for worship. It does tell us to sing in Ephesians 5.19, to pray in Philippians 4, verse 6, to study God's word in Acts 20, verses 7 to 9, to give up our means in 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. The New Testament does teach that there is no clergy or laity distinction, and, all, and that all men who are Christians may lead the congregation in worship. All you got to do is take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and chapter 14, and you will see that all of these people can lead in worship, and that there is no specific clergy-laity distinction. And then the Baptist church comes along and says the New Testament gives local church, the local church the authority on setting times of worship and orders of worship. We see this in Hebrews 10, 24, and 25, where the command not to forsake the assembling of ourselves. and Acts 20, verse 7, the local church in Troas met at most likely night because Paul preached there until midnight. The local church does have that, because, that authority because there is no set time other than the Lord's day when the church needs to meet. If it wants to meet on Monday or Thursday or Saturday, it can also do those things. Because we find in Acts 2, the church meeting daily. But each church gets to set its time and place of meeting. That is not prescribed in Scripture. So those are some things that Baptists get right about worship. What do they get wrong? Well, the Lord's Supper in most Baptist churches is not, is not observed weekly. It's observed monthly or quarterly. But according to Scripture, it's to be done every week. In Acts 20, verse 7, Now on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message till midnight. The breaking of bread in that context is the Lord's Supper. So if this passage gives the church the authority to only observe the Lord's Supper on certain Sundays, maybe quarterly or, uh, or monthly. Does this verse also give the church authority to meet only once a month or to meet only once a quarter? And I don't think you'll find many Baptists that say that it does. So then why do we think that this verse gives authority to observe the Lord's Supper just whenever we want? This verse said the disciples came together on the first day of the week to break bread. There is a first day of the week in every week. Therefore, the disciples get to gather together to break bread on that day. The Baptists also get wrong that instrumental music is somehow a part of worship. Ephesians 5 verse 19 says, Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord. Where does the melody come from? It doesn't come from the piano or the organ or the guitar. It doesn't come from the choir that we just sit and listen to. The melody comes from our heart, and each Christian 
is to sing. Yes, some of us may not be good singers. Some may be out of tune. The tune itself is not the point of singing. The point of singing is to teach and admonish one another as Christians and to praise God. We are to make an effort, yes, to sing, but we do not need to be expert singers. And I believe that's why instruments were added because people liked A, listening to the music, but B, they said, well, I'm not a good singer. Therefore, if I only had musical instruments to drown out my bad singing, then maybe I could sing. Whatever the reason is, we never find instruments of music authorized in the New Testament. We find singing from the heart authorized, not musical instruments. The Old Testament can't be used as our authority. That governs temple worship. We don't have the temple. We aren't under the law of Moses. So we cannot use that in order to find authority. Instrumental music is not to be a part of worship. And we also don't set aside times for testimonials. Christians are always to be ready to give an answer for their faith. That's 1 Peter 3, verse 15. But there's a reason we don't set aside time in worship for testimonials of people of how they were saved. Because if you stand back and take a look at most of those testimonies, what are they? It's a focus on the person giving the testimony. Yes, they might refer to how God did something, but it's always for them. Romans chapter 10 verse 17 says, Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. God does not save me any differently than he saves you. And he doesn't save you any differently than he saves me. If someone wants to get up and talk about the scriptures they read that showed them what they needed to do to be saved, I'm all for that. There's no problem with that, as long as we are giving praise to God. But as soon as we turn the focus to ourselves and some special thing that happened to us, maybe that opened our eyes or some person that we met, well, then we have turned what is meant to be shown as God saving us to, well, look at what happened to me, and it can happen to you too. God saves us through his word. We can think about maybe how God's providence worked if we didn't grow up going to church and how we might have been in the right place at the right time through God's providence and heard the word and became Christians. But in the end, we became Christians the same way by believing in Jesus and repenting of our sins and being baptized for the remission of our sins. It's not some special thing God said to me or something that he put on my heart. The word of God is what saves. And so the Baptists get that wrong as well. So in conclusion, the Baptist church was not started by Christ. It was started by John Smith. The Baptist church does not teach the truth about the authority of scripture, about the proper mode of salvation, and they do not practice the worship that God desires. Therefore, because the Baptists aren't following Christ in regards to these things, I cannot be a Baptist and be saved by God. But I can be a Christian and be saved. I don't believe in Baptist doctrine to do that. I believe in the scriptures. Jesus said, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. So I need to believe in Jesus. Peter in Acts 2.38 said, repent and let every one of you be baptized for the remission of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. I need to repent of my sins. And yes, I need to be baptized for the remission of my sins because it is at baptism that I have my sins remitted by God, not a moment before. And so if you are in need of the saving grace of Jesus Christ. I don't plead on you to say a prayer for Jesus to come into your heart. I plead with you to believe in him, to repent of your sins, and to confess that faith and be baptized for the remission of your sins. If you will do that, you can be saved by God today. I'm not ashamed to own my Lord.